Lounge and Sun. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me today, I have one of my absolute favorite writers of all time. I have Mark Wade with me. Wrote the first comic book I ever I ever read as a kid, Flash eighty two from uh, your Flash run. Uh, you've written Superman, Avengers, Justice League, Daredevil. I mean, there's Spider Man. Everything um, that you've written has always been some of my favorite stuff. So it's a huge honor to have you on the show. No, my pleasure. Thank you for the kind words. So I always, I, you know, I always like to hear, you know, like kind of what started, uh, you know, somebody's love for the medium and like kind of what got them into it. Um, so I'd love to hear your your story. Sure. For me, it was the the original Batman TV show. I was just the right age. I was three going on four. Uh, my dad had read comics as a kid, not as a, not in, you know, in a, in a fanatical way, but like all kids did. And, uh, he introduced me to the TV show. He brought home some comics and then that was it that, you know, that cemented my love affair forever. And we moved around a lot when I was a kid, we, I went to something like, like 12 different schools in 10 years. And so the characters were, you know, in, with the situation like that, you don't get much of a chance to make friends or create bonds or whatever. So the characters were actually the constant in my life. And that didn't, you know, it didn't hurt my, you know, my love for them. It, it certainly helped me forge a bond with these characters. And that's, you know, I've said this before, but this is really why I'm in comics. It's not so much that I'm a tortured writer that needs some sort of outlet for his passion. Um, it's just that I really love these characters. You can tell that, that you have just such a, a love for every character you write. And it seems like any book that I've read by you, you just, you get the character to their core. Like that's okay. something that has always stood out to me. In terms of becoming, you know, a professional within the industry, you ha you got your start, I believe, at Fanagraphics as yeah. an editor. As an editor there, working on their fan magazines. Um, and then before that, a little bit, doing a lot of convention volunteer work. So you know, I'd be the guy ferrying you to and from the airport and, you know, taking you through the fast food line if, you know, on the way or whatever, if you were so desired. Or in Dave Sims' case, driving you through Dealey Plaza in Dallas because he was a big uh, Kennedy fan. So, you know, and then being there with him at the bar after hours for two hours the day after his divorce was final and listening to him talk about his divorce that I'm strange complete stranger but here I am just listening away and and so between those two you know that that helped me network in a time when network wasn't a word yet and make con connections and contacts with various comics creators and comics editors and so at this point 87 I guess it was I'd been editing for a while. I'd been doing a lot of writing for fan magazines. And I got a call from Dick Giordano, who was the editor at uh, the main editor at DC Comics, and asked me to come in for an interview. Um, a couple of months later, I got the call and went, you know, went pro. What what um about DC? Because I feel like I, I I know you've written for both, but I've always yeah. like associated DC comics with you. And it's probably because you know my first comic book was one written by you at DC. Um but what is it about the DC universe that um, that held such a strong affinity in your heart? Well, some of it is just exposure. Some of it is that, you know, in the 60s, Marvel had really spotty distribution as it was, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because DC Comics was distributing, it was distributing Marvel Comics. And so there was a limit to how many comics they could have out and how many they could publish and so forth. Um, so especially then in rural Alabama, you know, DC Comics ride or die because you find the occasional Marvel comic, but not really. Uh, so that's part of it. The other part of it is just that I like the iconography of characters. I like the mythology of characters. I like the, the characters that are really larger than life. I love the Marvel characters too, but in a different way. They're people, but mm -hmm. you know, the DC characters are icons and I, I really enjoy playing with the icons. And in terms of like, you know, like you're talking about mythology and then you also think like for DC, I, like one of the first words that comes to mind is legacy, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think that, I mean, Wally West is my absolute favorite character, but I want to, I'm kind of curious, like what about that character kind of attracted you to that project? And, and just like, what about that, that run? Like right. what, what do you remember fondly about that run? It was, I mean, it wasn't something I strove for because 
I was a big Barry Allen fan, and I and but I had no issue with him dying in crisis because it was the most interesting thing that had happened to him in years. Um, so I wasn't like a diehard Wally West fan, uh, but when the the book came open for a writer, editor Brian Augustine offered me the chance, and you know I, I liked the character, but I, I didn't have the same passion for him as I did for say Superman or or some of the other characters. Uh, but we went out to lunch. We talked a great deal about. Born to Run, which became the, the very first story arc, which sort of re, like wiped the slate clean and redid Wally's origin for a modern audience. And in doing that, I sort of found connections and, and places where I identify with a character. I think the biggest one being that what was Wally West, but a kid who dreamed of growing up to be the Flash and then got the job and was the happiest man on earth. And, and I felt the same way about comics, right? I just, I love comics and I love these characters and I was a fan made good and, and so was Wally. Wally was a fanboy who made good. And I think that was a big part of the, of the connection. Um, and then once I get, and also super speed, hands down, my favorite superpower, my dream superpower, flying, bah, bah, I can get in a plane and fly, but mm the idea that I could do all my homework in five minutes and then have the rest of the weekend free or that I could spend the weekend reading the entire works of Dickens or whatever. That's awesome. That's still a dream. I stand behind him. I stand before a shelf of chemicals in every rainstorm, hoping for the best. <laughs> and I, what I, what I really love too, is like you really expand on, I mean, he's got the chemicals that hits him, right? He gains super speed, but you really established so much of, what the modern audience knows about the flash, the speed force. Like where did the thought come to create this other dimensional type of like energy that they draw from? I, I know that we were coming up near issue 100 and I don't remember if that played in specifically, but the writing process of flash was always the same. I'd get on the phone with Brian Augustine and we would talk and we would play, can you top this? And we would make each other laugh because, and this is the God's honest truth, the best ideas start at joke, as jokes. That's the absolute truth. And uh, because what is an idea that, uh, what is a good idea, but something that surprises you? What is a joke, but something that surprises you? Um, so it would build from there, or I would have a random idea or an idea for an image in my head that, that I would share with him or whatever. And, and it was always a great collaboration. And I remember distinctly at one point one day, and I don't know where this thought came from, I wondered what the flashes see when they exceed the speed of light. What is that? And that became a conversation with Brian Augustine. And that became the, the idea that there's some other force out there. And that became a way of sort of tying together the flashes, the various flashes origins, including Jay Garrick's, which even by Golden Age comics standards didn't make a whole lot of sense you, inhaling the fumes of heavy water, yeah. uh, or actually hard water, which, or, or as we know it, ice. That was, you know, that 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 didn't fit, right? So, was there a way to make that organic? And so, that's that's really where that came from, and then it just sort of expanded beyond that as we went from month to month. One of the things like that I that I really remember fondly too is uh, Mike Marengo's art, and it's somebody that you go on to collaborate with again on your acclaimed Fantastic Four run. Um, yeah. how like that there's such a gap right between the time that you spent with him on flash and then fantastic four yeah. um what about that relationship from flash uh made you like want to re reunite with him for that fantastic well, four first off he's one of the most talented guys i ever worked with um mm -hmm. bar none i mean you know one of my top two or three artists that i've ever worked with and I don't even know that I put anybody above him. I'm just saying that, you know, no one, no one beats him. And it, it, he was such a good storyteller and he was an amiable guy. I mean, it was just a very pleasant experience to work with him because he was so excited and enthused. And one of my favorite things about Mike uh, is that he not only was not afraid of drawing a certain drawing, you know, drawing certain things or didn't shy away from drawing certain things that other artists kind of balk at like baseball stadiums and horses. But he was excited whenever I tried to give him something that he'd never drawn before, even if it was something very complex and took a lot of effort and time, if he'd never drawn it before he was in 
And so, and that played into my sensibilities and my attempts to always try to show you stuff you've never seen before. And that, you know, that worked to our advantage. So, you know, I'd be working with him today, you know, were he still alive. And I would, I would have, I would not let him out of my sight. It would be the relationship you have with a five-year-old child, which is that you can play in the yard and you can work, you can play with others from time to time. But at the end of the day, you come home and you don't cross the street. And, and like you talk about, um, you know, iconography, like is what really stands out to you. I mean, obviously you've worked on Cap, right? You've worked on Daredevil, both very iconic figures within the comic book industry as well. But what I think um, stands out too is that every single run that you do with any character, there's always a joy to it. Yeah. Like it's always like bright, like you took Daredevil out of the kind of darker tones that it was going on. And I think yeah. the stuff you were doing in the 90s where there was a lot of I mean, people sometimes refer to it as like the dark age of comics because it was like grim and gritty era, yeah. right? Yeah. But your stuff was never that. Your no. stuff always had that core, like the joy of comics and in inspired yeah. by it. That's, you know, comics is not about rules and comics is not about, you know, superhero comics, not about rules. Superhero comics mm -hmm. are not about pain and agony. Superhero comics are about flying. That's what superhero comics are about. Um, and... I, you know, you like characters with internal issues, you like characters you can sympathize with, but at the same time, you know, characters who are in, you know, or, or having real problems, you know what, you can fly, shut up. I don't want to hear your real problems. I, I, again, I love the characters. That, that's really what it comes down to. I dreamed of being these characters when I was a kid, like we all did, but I just have such an emotional connection with these characters that I know them better than I know most members of my own family. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be able to talk to you about my uncle for half an hour, but I can talk to you about Aquaman for a day. How did that play a factor in Kingdom Come? Kind of, was that a kind of response to the grim and gritty era, would you say? Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it began with Alex. I mean, Alex came to the table having done Marvels and, and creating a, a real cachet for himself, came to DC with the basic idea of, you know, it's years later, the heroes have retired and Superman comes back and, you know, that's, it wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of meat on the bone, but that's because Alex was concentrating as much on the images as he was on, on the thinking. So we sat down over lunch, we hit it off. Uh, we started talking about the fact that even though I think there's somewhere like a 10 or 12 year age disparity between us, he grew up reading the, like those DC hundred page super spectaculars with all the gold mage reprints in them and stuff so he was a fan of the same era of comics that i was and we just bonded over how much we a love these characters b hated the grim and gritty approach and c just wanted to do something life-affirming and something positive because you know, I can't speak for Alex all the time because I don't, you know, I, I don't know whether this is his, his guiding star, but certainly for me, I just don't have any use for cynical work. I just don't because it's so easy. Anybody can write a cynical story. Anybody can write a story that is full of angst and pain and cynicism and really doesn't say much and really doesn't do much to inspire, doesn't do much to have any sort of ethical or moral component to it. Anybody can do that. It's harder to do inspirational, life affirming, positive work, and so I'll I take that I take that effort. And so, and th that that kind of like leads perfectly into like Daredevil was the most break, and in, in terms of literally yeah. like where that that run before you ended, and then where you take Matt Murdock coming yeah. past that. What were your initial thoughts? Like, was that editorial, or was that like? they offered you the daredevil gig and you're like, well, I'm going to take it in this direction. Like what were your thoughts in terms of how's the fan, how are the fan base going to react to this considering they've had all these years of Matt like this and now we're right. taking him this direction. It is a little bit of both. It is a little bit of editorial, and a little bit of me. And just as an aside real quick, I, I just, I can't think about, gee, how will the fans respond? when I start this stuff, because that's a rabbit hole that you will never get out of. And, you know, there will always be people who think that your approach sucks. So, and they are invariably the loudest, by the way, although they don't <laughs> buy the most comics. Um, 
And so I just, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to do anything that would appall the fans, but at the same time, you got to give the audience something that they hadn't expected. You have to give, the audience doesn't know what it wants. If it knew what it wanted, it wouldn't be an audience. You know, it's a famous story of, you know, Henry Ford saying, you know, if you'd asked people before the car was invented, if you'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. You know, they, you don't know what you want until you see it. So with Daredevil, uh, Steve Wacker, who'd been my editor at DC on 52 and Legion and other stuff, uh, had called me as the editor of Daredevil and said, look, we're looking at taking a slightly more superhero approach to it because it's been so relentlessly dark and grim for such a long time. And there's, you know, either we're going to turn Daredevil into a villain full blown, or we're going to try to make him a superhero, one of the two. We got to do something. And that played into my sensibilities. Um, it partly because I, I, you know, I was given the chance, but also because I don't do that well. I mean, I, I, I know my limitations. I'm not a great, gritty crime writer. Uh, cause it, I just don't have a passion for it. So whatever I did with Daredevil, if I was going to follow the Frank Miller road, I'm not going to be any better than Frank Miller. How could I possibly better be better than Frank Miller? I'm not going to be as good as Bendis, you know, because that's his lane. Uh, what do I do? Well, I do character driven superhero stuff. Well, and that's the approach we took. I, we would have been dead in the water after six issues had we not had Paulo Rivera and Marcos Martin on the art. Brilliant artists, amazing artists who made it abundantly clear, this is a shot across the bow. This is something you've never seen with Daredevil before. Here's a brand new approach. Uh, if it had been drawn by just some random artist that you know looks like Jim Lee, like so many of them do, or looks like a second, third generation Jim Lee, I don't think it would have done. Anyway, I think it would have been a, a nice little blip and then we'd still be reading about Matt Murdock needing a drink every time he has an adventure. That is not to denigrate the dark and greedy work. It's awesome, but it's not what I do. And that said, the thing that annoys me sometimes, and it's not you, but I, but I get the criticism about Daredevil was because, it, I don't know, there's a huge part of fandom that sees comics in a real binary mode. Either they are super dark and super grim, or they are wacky and funny. And they're, to them, there's like, there's no gray area in between. And the gray area is where I live. Mm -hmm. So yes, there was some humor to Daredevil when I came, when I brought it, when I came aboard, there was some lightness to it. But at the same time, if you read between the lines or if you read some of the, you know, some of the actual issues, horrible things happen to Matt. Horrible, horrible things happen to Matt. And, you know, there's some really grisly images in those runs and, and, you know, closet full of human heads. I mean, <laughs> that's not wacky. That's not funny. That's not yeah. light and, and, and happy. But so the same number, the same kind of horrible things happen to Matt and the same sort of trauma that he goes through. He's very vocal about the trauma he's going through happened to Matt in my run, I think the only real difference was in how Matt reacted to it. And that coupled with the art that didn't look like a Jim Lee clone. I don't know. I mean, again, I'm not complaining because the book did very well. People are very happy with it. It, you know, it's, it's in hard covers and trade paperbacks until I die. But, you know, I, I just, I know, there's something about the binary nature of most fandom that or at least the vocal part of fandom that just rubs me the wrong way because there's so much room in between wacky and happy and super dark. I mean, I totally agree. It's, it's some of the arguments I've had, you know, working in a shop, you know, in the past, I mean, I, I was full-time in a shop for, for a little while. So I was able to do it more often, but I'm only there one day a week now. And, but I totally get it. I totally hear those complaints. And to me, it's just never made sense. It's never yeah. made sense to me. It's this way or that way. And like, yeah. it, it, that, that's not the type of comic book I want to read because then it just feels kind of like, well, I've seen that. It's nothing. Yeah. Am I getting anything one, new? And very one note. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's what, I mean, I think even in your flash run, like I said, it was, it was a joy to it, but there were some, there were some really dark moments that happened to Wally, but not, not in such a way that it felt like it was dark to be dark. No. I mean, in fact, the, the reason, one of the reasons they came across as so dark is because you were able to contrast them with the light moments within the same story. That to me is my favorite thing to do is make you happy for about three pages. And then you turn the page and something truly, truly emotionally horrible happens to one of the characters that you didn't see coming. I love that up and down as I write. And I, I enjoy lulling you into a false sense of security that everything <laughs> can be okay. And then you turn the page and oh my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I I think that's why Wally West became my favorite character because I felt like I, I became attached to the character in yeah. ways that not every every run or every writer like necessarily gives me that same feeling for a character um daredevil i already loved but your run with you know with those artists chris somni as well i mean it's just phenomenal you know i mean your cap run amazing superman birthright i mean i i could go on you know i mean your justice your tower of Babel storyline i still that's like a certain storylines i will continuously go back to i mean i have multiple versions of, of cool. some of the stories too like i'll get the trades i'll get the hardcovers the deluxe all that stuff i um, i have no issue with you double dipping <laughs> um you know I, something also that i kind of wanted to ask you because it's just something we don't see necessarily anymore long runs maybe not with the same you know entire creative team writer artist um but you have extensive runs with every character that you write it's very rare that i've read like one storyline by you and then we're done um why do you think that's something we don't necessarily see as much anymore i think it's a combination of the fact that the popular books especially at both marvel and dc the way to make revenue is to do them 15 or 18 times a year you know is is to do more than one a month and no artist can keep up with that you know very few can and so there is, you don't get that sense of a continual string of, of books. You may have the same writer over, I don't know, detective comics over the, over two years or whatever, but you're going to have five different artists and therefore they're not invested in the book as deeply as an, as it, if it were their regular assignment and the reader doesn't get as invested because they're, you know, that the, the bond with those characters and the way they look and the way they act, the way they express themselves is not always the same. So that's a shame. Uh, and also, you know, we very much have encouraged creative people to write, not write for the trade in the sense that you pad a story out to take more issues than it should take, although, but at least to think in terms of, okay, here's the start and here's the ending of a storyline so that it becomes one trade paperback that you can sell over and over again. Uh, even World's Finest is like that. World's Finest is conceived as here's a five issue story. Mm-hmm. And then it's, you know, same team, same creative team, same, you know, we'll have a fill in on issue six with a, with a different artist, but then with seven through, you know, 11 or whatever, it's going to be another story. And then after that, and then after that, so continual, but as less, you know, and not as much as you'd see with Flash or Captain America a little more defined in terms of when the stories begin and when they end. I don't love that either, to be honest. I mean, I there's a magic in, in writing an ongoing series that you don't feel constrained on, that you can just do whatever you want to do every month and keep surprising yourself as a writer and not worry too much about structure. Because that's when you get long form stories. That's when you get stuff where you're planting seeds that you don't even realize as a writer you're planting, that you can come back to and revisit and and make it all feel like a cohesive story or make it all look like you had it all planned all along, which you don't, but it looks like it. And, you know, I and also, and then I, I'll, I'll end with this, but I mean, if you look at The Return of Barry Allen, mm-hmm. one of the things we fought very hard against was having it be part one of five, part two of five. You didn't know. You didn't know how many parts there were to the story because the moment you know parts one through five and you read issue four, you start you start filling in, in your head like what's going to happen in issue five. You know there's an end. You know where the end point is. Right. And so that 
automatically takes away some of the surprise factor, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas with Return of Barry Allen, it was just, we're going to do this story until it reaches its end and you're just going to be with us and you're not going to know where we're going. And you don't get that as much in comics anymore. And I, that's a shame. Uh, there's a There's got to be a space for it, but I can't find it right now. Yeah, I feel like it's, I feel like sometimes I am now the minority of, of fans that wants those like longer runs, wants to be able to be like, go read that run by like, you know, by Mark Way, go read that run by Walt Simonson, go read that Frank Miller run. Now it's like, go read that trade paperback by this yeah. creator. Like, that's it, you know, and then it's done. And I feel like um, it is something that I feel is missing in the industry. Uh, and, and, and all fans, I think, would, would latch on to if you put a great creative team. And yeah. you give them the good marketing too, and you market that book well. I think it has a lot of room to succeed. Well, let's look at Saga. I mean, Saga is the, yeah. the exemplar of that, right? I mean, that yes, there are. If you look closely to the way Brian structures this stuff, there are sort of natural breaks that collect themselves into into volumes, or he has some ideas. He's writing, you know, this is going to be volume one of this run or whatever. But you don't see the seams, you know, you you don't see the the joints, which I love. Uh, it reads just as one long run. And there's, so there's ways to do it. I think for that, I think though, for the best results, you do need a consistent creative team and you need to work out ahead of time, how you're going to collect this stuff because it's going to be collected regardless. So is there a way to do it where you're not creating seams um, or the seams are, are not as visible with, with world's finest? I hope so too, because with world's finest, you know, we do come to an end of the Nezha story with issue five, but something happens in issue five that gives you a cliffhanger that leads into issue six, that gives you a cliffhanger that leads into issue seven. Uh, so it's not sort of like, okay, we're done with this adventure. See you next month and we're going to start all over again. Mm-hmm. And, and let's talk Let's talk about World's Finest because um, I was ecstatic when I found out that book was coming out. I think that Dan Mora, great, uh, great choice. So I mean, he just is such an amazing artist. And to see him getting all this push now, especially after, you know, Once in Future kind of gave him a, a little bump, and now he's doing so well with DC. Um, yeah. How did, how did that book come about? How did the project come about? And, like, what are your long-term plans for the book? Um, well, first off, I'm staying on until they kick me off. So that's – I'm not going anywhere. Um, I, there was a change in management at DC. Uh, a couple of years ago and the phone rang off the hook, which is awesome because everybody knew, everyone knew I wanted to be writing DC comics, but I wasn't allowed to. Um, Like a lot of other creative people on a blacklist, we weren't allowed to be there. Uh, When the change of management happened, the blacklist evaporated, phone calls were made uh, and the red carpet was rolled out, which is very flattering, very nice. And uh, I started talking with editor Paul Kaminsky, who was at that time, not yet the Superman editor, but he had the custody of Superman, Batman, which Gene Yang was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was coming to a, well, actually it wasn't coming to a close yet. It was, uh, I had just said, you know, if that book ever comes available, like that's the dream book for me as a, as a Superman, Batman team up book. And he just kind of filed it away for a couple of months. And then a couple of months later, you know, Gene is going to wind up his run and, Let's see if we can relaunch that book. Hey, Mark Wade expressed some interest and he called me up and I was just on it because that's, you know, World's Finest was one of my favorite comics growing up. It's Superman and Batman in the same story. That's pretty cool. Uh, And I have so much to say about both characters. So, you know, it was a natural fit. And then Dan Mora was just icing on the cake. I mean, Paul, one of the things I love about working with Paul and his assistant Dave is that that office has a real eye for talent in terms of art, in terms of what makes a good story. Uh, but really in terms of art, I mean, that's, you know, the, the people that Paul comes to me with, Hey, would you like to work with this guy? Hey, would you like to work with this woman? Hey, would you like to work with this creator? They're all a list talent. They're all like, you're going to hit it out of the park with these people. So why am I not working with them? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And how much do you think, this is something like that you could speak on from experience too, like as you're trying, as spending time as an editor, how, how important do you think that is to the success of a line of books or a run of books or to the entire company? Because I, for me, I sometimes can see when it doesn't look like a poorly edited book, 
you know, I, I feel like I can kind of like I've been reading long enough, you know, I've and I've talked to editors myself, too. So I feel like I kind of tell. Um, but yeah. how important do you think that is? And do you think that that is why some books kind of seem at times, I, I, I mean, for lack of a better word, aimless? Yeah, I think so. I think that like, you know, like casting for a movie in comics, it, you know, creating a comic book is like 90 percent casting. You know, you get the exact right writer, you get the exact right artist or the right writer artist or whatever. You get the right combination of creative people and you let them go and you give them their head and you don't dictate story to them because as an editor, your job is to help them tell their story within parameters. You're working with IP that is not that you don't own as a writer. So there's guardrails, you know, and you've got to be mindful of the fact that other people are doing stories about these characters either past or future or the same time. And so you can't always do exactly what you want because, oh, geez, this is too close to something that happened six months ago in another book, or this is too close to something that somebody else is developing. Um, but it, it really is. You can tell a badly edited comic because there's just no consistency to it. The, you know, the art's all over the place. The, the storytelling is all over the place. Um, and frankly, Creative people don't want to work with bad editors. So it's, you know, that's one of, that's the read, you know, natural, you know, good editors and good creative people find each other magnetically because no one wants to work with lesser talent. I'm really glad that black, I didn't know there was some sort of a blacklist for creators, but I am very glad that that is gone because anytime you're writing a book at DC is a good time for DC comic Thank you. books. You know, I've, I felt like, and I, I mean, as a fan, I didn't know, I didn't know there was a reason you weren't writing any DC. Oh books. yeah. I said, no, I mean, you know, cause we don't go around broadcasting, right. but nobody, nobody's, you know, Devin Grayson is not proud to be on a blacklist, you know, um, there's, you know, so, you know, so many creative people from the nineties and the early aughts that were, you know, if you ever think to you, if you ever wonder your, to yourself, huh, this person who was doing this comic at DC in the late 90s or early 2000s, I wonder what ever happened to them. Chances are they were just basically blacklisted because that they didn't fit the very, very, very narrow vision of what DC comics were supposed to be from about 2011 to, you know, about 2020. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with where they're leaning towards now. And I, I you know, I, I think it's interesting, your choice in World's Finest set in the past. How do you feel about this, um, this the, the Omniverse that DC has now adapted, or adopted, I mean, and now, like, not to say, not to say that every story didn't matter before, but now, like, everything exists within, and every yeah. story is connected. How does that, how does that feel to come into that? It's, it's great. I mean, it, it in a perfect world, like a lot of fans, I really do like a tight continuity. I really do enjoy, you know, mapping DC continuity from the, you know, 50s to the 80s or whatever, because it's all still very much one fairly cohesive universe in the 60s and 70s. And I like that. I like the long-term continuity. But that barn, you know, that, that horse came out of that barn a long time ago. You cannot... To extend the metaphor, you cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube because we've broken it so much time, so many times with DC Comics mm -hmm. and continuity and what is continuity and what's not continuity that this was the creation of hypertime for you know the kingdom, which Grant and I came up with and was promptly buried and killed with a shovel and buried and out back because, ooh, we don't want, you know, we want to pretend like we still have continuity. Uh, but, you know, Grant never gave up. <laughs> And, and now we have the multiverse and the omniverse because, look, you, you, like I said, you can't, you, can't put that, you can't put that back. You just, there's just no way after all this time to fool you into thinking that all DC co continuity is very tight and connected. So just tell the best stories you can. And, you know, when I was offered the book, I didn't say I want to do not this version, not this version. Um, people know that I, I really respect what Tom Taylor and Philip Kennedy Johnson are doing. And I really think that, you know, I, I fans, you know, fan, I have to accept the fact that most fans were born after Lois and Superman got married. You say, so I'm, you know, I, I, I respect their enjoyment of that version of the character. It's not a version that speaks to me, that's all. 
no, no slight intended, but that's not a version of the character that speaks to me. So the fact that Paul came to me and said, we want a very classic version of these characters, the, the, the version that most civilians know. Here's Batman in the Batcave and Alfred and Commissioner Gordon, and here's Superman and he's got a secret identity back and they're not married, he's not married to Lois and there's a lot of flexibility there. That's what we want came to me and I and that was a perfect fit so let's set this sort of in some indeterminate point in DC's relative past and do that but at the same time making sure that with every story there is a reason that you should be paying attention because there's something in this story that is going to pay off in DC comics in present day sooner than later that's certainly you know, this is not the last you've seen in Neza, and that is planned. Uh, the next arc, again, you've, we've setting something up that I think will surprise you. But when you finish reading the story, you're like, oh, my God, now I now I see how that fits into what's coming up in DC Comics. And, you know, I'm glad I'm prepared. Yeah, I'm very, very excited for the book. You said six is going to have a different artist, but then is Dan Moore coming back for yeah. the arc after that? Yeah. All right, very cool. And then in terms of anything else that you're working on, um, is there any other books in the works, anything that you can talk about or tease in any way, shape, or form? There's, there's other stuff. I, I can't really, I, this, for the, I think for the first time in my creative life, I can only tell you about one book or maybe two because everything else I'm doing is currently under wraps. I mean, I think the whole world knows at this point that I'm doing a, a black label Superman book with Brian Hitch mm -hmm. that will see print someday. You know, I have to finish writing it. Brian has finished drawing it, but what he's drawn so far is astounding. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it is, you know, one, it's sort of my definitive take on Lex Luthor, my own definitive, my own personal definitive take. Um, gosh, no, everything is either unannounced or in development, or I am doing a book, I am doing a short story for that Ukraine benefit, benefit book that uh, Scott Dunbeer is putting together. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm doing that with Gabriel Rodriguez. So that's, a, that's, going to be amazing it's a guy that's an artist i've wanted to work with for a long time and he's amazing um other than that ask me again in like four months and i can tell you a bunch of stuff all right well i'm definitely gonna ask you again in four months <laughs> i definitely want to have you back on um so one more thing before i let you go um a couple days ago we lost yeah. one of the one of the greats we lost neil adams um yeah. synonymous with greatness i mean what he's done to not just with his art but for creators' rights is, yeah. is just unfounded, you know? Um, so I was wondering if, you know, maybe you could share some thoughts on Neil, maybe, you know, personal story um, of just to kind of remember him. Sure. I mean, you know, Neil was, for those who are watching or listening and, and don't really have a firm grasp on this, Neil was one of the very first creators to come into comics who grew up a fan of the comics. In the... 30s 40s 50s well in the 30s and 40s people can't creators came into comics because it was a gig because they were you know prose writers who couldn't make it or you know they were art at commercial commercial artists who couldn't get a newspaper strip and so they came into comics and that's not to denigrate their work some of them were amazing you know and and some of them really helped define what comics look like obviously kirby and and will eisner don't fit in that in that category they were you know sui generis they were you know, brilliant. But in the 50s, I mean, it was just seen as such a, a crap medium. You know, there were so many crusades against comics from angry parents groups, and they were seen as the cause of juvenile delinquency. And it was something you didn't brag about at dinner parties. If you, what do you do for a living? I, uh, I, I write stuff. I write kids material. That's what you'd say. You don't say, I'm working on a comic book. In this, so, so nobody came in, nobody broke in the comics in the 50s. In the 60s, mid 60s or so, that's when people started filtering in Neil Adams. And after that, you know, Denny O'Neill and Steve Skates and uh, Steve Englehart and Len Wein and Mark Wolfman. That's when you got that second wave. Neil was one of the very first to do this. And he was always a breakout artist. I mean, there's no way to look at even the earliest Neil Adams stuff. And not look at it and go, this looks like nothing else. You know, this doesn't look like Kurt Swan. This doesn't look like Jack Kirby. This doesn't look like Gil Kane. This is something completely in terms of layout, in terms of the realism of it, in terms of the 
you know, just just the the impact of the work, the visual impact, and especially DC, where everything was still fairly tame and tepid, and there was there weren't a whole lot of fist fights in DC Comics, and there wasn't a whole lot of action. It was very much a plot driven, you know, uh, line of comics. Here comes Neil with his explosive graphics, and he made his mark. He was maybe the first creator to work both at Marvel and DC at the same time um, openly because there was a sort of a understanding that in the 60s if you worked at DC and you wanted to work at Marvel you took on a pen name mm -hmm. uh, just so they wouldn't nobody would put two and two together like nobody's no, like nobody can tell Gil Kane artwork you know it's ridiculous <laughs> but you know Gil Kane was an early one today but Neil was the one who just said screw it I'm not dealing with pseudonyms I'm going to work for both companies whether you like it or not and he did um beyond that I mean the, he just he and Jim Steranko are the two men two artists who define what comics look like today they were the first to bring sort of a pop art influence to what was fairly especially DC, very cut and dried and very sort of tame and kid-friendly and, and not terribly visually interesting. Uh, the two of them brought cinema. The two of them brought dynamism. They, the two of them just made comics look different. And every artist who has started in comics after them owes a debt to either Neil or Jim or both. So Neil does comics for like, you know, 67, 68, 69. So the method look late, the early 70s or so he's, he's getting more and more advertising work and more and more other outside work that's actually frankly paying better and he loves comics but he does fewer and fewer comics uh and so every once in a while you'd see a neil adams story in the 80s or when it would be like a big special event um but he during that time was also spending a lot of time in the 70s fighting for joe uh, joe schuster and jerry siegel to get credit for superman when the big christopher reeve movie was announced and it was going to be a multi-million dollar thing and Siegel and Schuster were still getting nothing and had been drummed out of the company and blackballed and Neil along with, uh, with, uh, you know, Jerry Robinson, uh, came along and, and really shook the tree and went very public because Neil is, you know, Neil was a, a loud man in a good way. Uh, it was, he was, he was not shy about expressing his opinions. Um, to the public, to the press. And that's the kind of guy you, that's kind of bulldog you want on your side. So that alone, like gets him in, in the comic book hall of fame, just making sure that Siegel and Schuster and then other creators after that got their due. But, you know, that's, that's Neil um, up to the end. I mean, I was the last guy to work with. I was the last writer to work with Neil. And I wish that were not true, but it is. And that's the way it is. And, at 78, he was still turning in pages that looked every bit as good as the stuff I read when I was a kid, and in a lot of ways better. He just, who gets to be 78 years old and is still at the top of their game? You know, that's something we can all shoot for. In terms of personal stories, I know I've gone on and on, but Neil's a, you know, Neil's a big thing. Yeah, no. about Neil for hours. I mean, you know, that's a big subject. Um, my own personal, one of my personal stories about Neil is that when I was an editor at DC Comics, uh, I went to Dick Giordano once and Dick had worked with Neil, you know, off and on for years and years. And they were good friends. Um, and I went to Dick and I said, I'm just curious. I said, I know that, you know, when you're, Neil is, a, Neil is a notoriously horrible at deadlines. Neil notoriously had never met a deadline and it, hardly ever. And I asked him once, I said, you know, I, he, you guys did a lot of advertising work. And I, it's one thing when you're late with a comic page for about a week or whatever, you know, that's not good, but it's not catastrophic. But if you're like a major, if you're, you know, I don't know, Procter and Gamble, if you're, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, if you're whatever, if you're a movie company and you're looking for that kind of work and you need advertising work and you hire Neil and he's late, that's got to be like, Armageddon. Mm -hmm. How did that work? And Dick looked at me and he said, it's true. Neil would be as late with those people as he was with comics. But here's the thing. Six months later, they wouldn't remember how late it was. 
all they would remember is how good it was. And that's absolutely true. And that's, it's a stupid thing to tell a assistant editor because, you know, I'm supposed to be holding people's feet to the fire with deadlines, but it left a mark on me as a creator that yes, by all means, you know, do everything you possibly can to meet that deadline. But at the end of the day, if it's going to take another couple of days to make it as good as it possibly can be, take that time because again, no one ever, no one ever looks at a comic that's almost great and goes, oh, well, you know, I guess he just didn't have another week to finish it. No, they just look at it and go, ah, this isn't good. They, you know, people forget that Watchmen took like 17 months to, to get out of 12 issues. People forget that Dark Knight Returns did not come out monthly, even though that was the intent. You know, it just, but what you remember is how good it is. Anyway, that's. It's a long answer to a short question, but that's sort of my Neil eulogy, if you will. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing it. And, um, you know, thank you so much for your time today. Sure. I know you're a busy guy and I, I appreciate you taking time to sit and chat comics with me. And um, before I let you go, if you want to just share where everybody that uh, can follow you online and, and stay up to date on all your projects, I'll also drop the links down below for you. Sure. I mean, you can you can find me at markway.com, although that site needs a serious revision. Um, you can find me on Facebook, which I'm not proud of because, you know, I, that's the old folks place. That's the old folks home. Um, but I stay because that's where my family is. So that's how I stay in touch. Um, I'm on Instagram as Wade Mark because some jerk took Mark Wade. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter kind of, but rarely because why yeah but that's kind of where you know those are the places the places you can find me all right cool well again thank you so much and i would totally love to do this with you again in the future if you're up for it all right let's let's talk again in a few months okay all right man sounds good have a good one you bet take care all right bye.